Well, hello there, Pastor Chad here with DP Sunday Q&A. And man, before I jump into the questions, what a glorious, great Sunday we had as Jesus was manifested through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially in the nine people hungry and open. And uh, what a great time together. We appreciate you adding to your scripture reading and your worship and your prayer fasting with us. So let's jump right in. We have a question. What did Jesus mean when he said Elijah came and they didn't recognize him? Matthew 17, it says that the disciples understood that he was speaking about John the Baptist. How? How was he Elijah? It's a good question. Well, uh, scripture oftentimes um, refers to uh, people or prophets and it's utilizing their life and ministry, but it's speaking uh, really about the spirit of God that was upon them. So in Malachi uh, 4, the very last chapter of the Old Covenant, uh, God prophesied through Malachi that um, he would send Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, hearts of the children to the fathers. Then, of course, uh, John the Baptist was born and he became that voice. And Jesus answers this question in Matthew 11, 12 through 14. He says, and from the days of John the Baptist into now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to receive, it is he who is Elijah to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the way it was fulfilled is because the same prophetic spirit, the spirit of God that was upon Elijah was put upon John the Baptist and he was the voice crying out in the wilderness who went before the Lord. So a uh, good question. Oftentimes when it comes to prophetic scriptures, they are multi-layered uh, prophecies and fulfillment present in the days of the actual uh, hearers who heard it. Uh, and then there's a future application and at times, there's also this application of the spiritual reality of the spirit of the prophet uh, that was upon Elijah was also on John the Baptist. Another question, which I was confident someone would ask this, and I was glad I was not wrong, said, when you mentioned the redemptive names of God, you shared four of them. Can you talk about the other three? Yes. The other three, first, you have uh, Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23 and verse 1. See, the effects of sin not only uh, obviously darkened our heart and we became by nature a child of wrath, according to Ephesians 2, but sin blinded us and sin deafened our ability to hear, meaning sin ruined our capacity in relating to God to be able to be led uh, by God in his spirit and to hear God. That's why Jesus, when he came, he said, look, I am the great shepherd. I'm the one now that's going to lead you into green pastures. I'm going to lead you out of that house of bondage that you were in. So in redemption, the redemptive nature of God is he restores what Adam lost through his willful uh, transgression. And of course, Eve sinned through deception. And then we all likewise have went astray in sin. And so in Christ, God has brought us back to what he intended in the beginning, that we can walk with him and he can lead us, that our steps can be ordered of him, that we can walk in now the good works that we were created for in Christ uh, Jesus. Uh, next is um, Jehovah Shema. The Lord is ever present. He is ever present. Ezekiel 48, 35. Um, and so it's because now sin's been dealt with and we're in right standing with God, and now the spirit of Christ lives in us, we have access wherever we're at consistently to God's presence and learning to live with the awareness um, of Christ in us, the hope of glory and the presence of God being with us. Uh, what a blessing it is. In fact, in the Old Testament, God prophesied and said that that's a a fruit that was a promise of the new covenant. And he said, I will dwell in them and walk with them and I will be their God and they will be my children. I'll be a father to them. So come out from among them, from the culture, from the sins of the culture, repent 
Trust in me and I will receive you and be a father to you. So, And then a Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is our provider. Genesis 22, 18, uh, 8 through 14. And, you know, God knows we have needs. And in order for those needs to be met, we live in an economy that the exchange of goods works through um, what's called money. And money allows us, in a sense, to have debt, to be able to give an item we have to someone, but they don't have what we want, but we can sell an item to them. They give us a note, a dollar of money, and we can take that. It's an obligated sense debt to another store and then purchase what it is we wanted. And so that, back in the day, of course, sped up trade uh, and who you could trade with and or who you could sell something to. Now you don't just have to sell something to someone that has what you want. You can sell some something to anyone and get that money and then that money is a tender something that's good that you can go any anywhere else and then get what you actually wanted and so it speaks to the daily necessities of life and the father knows what we have need of and so in redemption you need to understand poverty is a curse god created an abundant world you look in the beginning genesis 3 god delights in the prosperity of his children uh, the way his children live reflects him. And so he's provided for us to be able to be empowered to get the wealth we need for the call of God upon our life. Now, it is relevant because all of us aren't called to the same nation or same place. And so what um, financially is relevant in one context and one nation is different than another. Uh, or what one person's called to or needs if they have a large family versus someone that don't have children, it's relevant. But the point is, is in the gospel, the blood of Jesus has purchased that poverty and and the tolsome uh, burden to hold God's people down has been broken. Christ has removed, has removed us, removed that curse off us. He has became that curse for us so that the blessing of Abraham, the empowerment of the Spirit can be upon us that our needs can be met in Christ Jesus. For Paul said, my God shall supply all your needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He is Jehovah Jireh. All right, the next question that was submitted was, did Jesus ever sing in the Bible? Can you talk to us about him singing to the Father? It's a great question. Yes, we know uh, he did scripturally in uh, Mark 14, 26. Um, Jesus institutes, of course, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. And uh, of course, verse 22, take eat, this is my body, goes down. Uh, and then verse 26 says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So we see already that what we looked at Sunday in the Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter two text, that we have a picture here of Jesus doing it with the disciples in the context of communion. And so why is that? Well, we know from 1 Corinthians 11, uh, what Paul received from the Lord, he says, often as you do this, you're declaring, testifying of my death. And what we talked about Sunday is that when Scripture talks about today's the day of salvation, in the death of Jesus, God has sec secured for every one of his born-again children the seven redemptive expressions of his nature for us that he's already purchased, that already uh, belong to us. So, um when Jesus worships with us, it's because we're one in spirit. And of course, we are glorifying uh, God the Father. And Jesus, as the firstborn among many brethren, the, the head of the new creation human race, uh, also leads us in that. And there's a lot to potentially get into that I didn't, um, even theologically and prophetically, you know, many uh, spirit field type scholars, um, and even some, I would say, mainline, see that the possibility Lucifer led worship when the angels um, before his sin and was cast out of heaven. So the pictures in the uh, Old Testament scriptures of Lucifer seems that he was called the light bearer and that instruments came from his body. So when the wind of God would blow, it would bring worship to God. When the light of God reflected off him, the glory would bring worship. Well, obviously, Jesus Christ has defeated Lucifer, Satan, and his kingdom. And so now 
through his resurrection, he took those that were captive, captive. And in that, in Jesus' captivity, frees us as humans and redeems us to be able to worship God in spirit and truth. Remember, that's what Jesus said. The Father's looking for those that work, worship in spirit and truth. And to see Jesus is like looking in a mirror, according to 2 Corinthians 4. And so then we see who, what we're created in. We're created in his image. He is the divine design for discipleship, God's blueprint for the new creation. So as we see him worshiping, we see what we were created to do as well, to delight ourselves in Lord, the Lord God and to commune with the Spirit of God. Next question. Uh, please explain what Jesus meant in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Man, I tell you what, what a great congregation we have that I just trust, you know, that I've memorized all the New Testament and Scripture and just said Matthew 7, 21, 23. I didn't even write it out like I knew it, but uh, it, of course, says, not everyone, this is Jesus speaking, who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Very important. This, of course, is coming in context right off of Jesus talking about uh, that we'll know people by their fruits. And he explains uh, spiritual fruit in three main categories. Our words, meaning what they teach and believe, uh, the will, uh, their will, and then the way they live, the way they go about fulfilling what their will is. And the key here is understanding that in verse 23, when he says, I never knew you, it's because it, he says that though they said, Lord, Lord, and had uh, prophesied, or they said, have we not prophesied or cast it in, they had never repented of their lawlessness. Jesus clearly says in verse 23, you who practice lawlessness. Now, the lawless one is Satan. The principle of sin is lawlessness, according to Apostle John in 1 John. So sin is lawlessness. Satan is the lawless one. So when Jesus is saying that they always practice lawlessness, they never repented of sin. So they said, Lord, Lord, but it's not just calling on the name of the Lord. The commanded response of God, according to Acts 17, 30 and 31, and God commands all people everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness and he has given assurance of this by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. God commands all people to repent. That means to change of mind and change the preference of our will that we no longer prefer our lawless will, lawless, living as our own law, as our own king and God. Instead, we want God's will. And then, of course, the second elementary teaching of Christ, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, after repentance from dead works, is faith toward God and the Christ provision uh, that he's provided, that lamb that's provided, Jesus Christ and him crucified. So this is a person who never repented. But they were obviously used of God. Now, this is interesting because God uh, wants to meet the needs of people. And what this shows is at times, someone can be hungry to be used of God, but they're not hungry for God. And we see in the book of Acts in Samaria, where Simon the sorcerer um, had the, the city really in his grip through deceitful arts and signs and wonders. And uh, after they received the word of God and were water baptized, they send the apostles down that they might uh, receive the Holy Spirit, be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Simon sees this display of power. And when he sees this display of power, he says, hey, I want to buy, I want to get this gift to be able to lay, lay my hands. It, it, according to other scriptural passages, gives sort of credence that that's um, what took place and what he saw. And then uh, he's witnessed the demonstration of the power of the Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, I want to do that. And of course, Peter said, repent. Your heart is filled with, with iniquity, with bitterness, jealousy. And um, you, you're trying to buy the gift of God. And so what that means is people can hunger to be used of God. And at times, uh, because God wants to reach people, he'll use someone that's hungry to be used of him, even if 
they have not yet repented. They've not yet repented. In fact, um, not that God uses my life, but when I ended up in the psychiatric ward, there was a man in the padded cell. And of course, I was still coming off of mixing drugs, but the man was in a padded cell there uh, in the psych ward, and he was preaching the gospel high on meth or crack. And um, so my point is, there's been people who were religious who thought they maybe were right with God, who gave tracts to people or sh shared the word of God with them. And God will use those seeds even if the person wasn't right because God is looking for those that are hungry. So one of the things that so often how this is used is people talk about, you know, they'll say so-and-so, you know, it's not born again, this or that. What I find great concern about, or they'll use this to despise like the power of God and casting out demons and doing wonders. And they're like, you know, well, you can cast out demons and you can prophesy and you can do wonders and still miss heaven and, and not be born again. And Jesus says, yeah, if you've not repented, not repented of your lawlessness and trusted in Christ and born again, then yes. But what I always find concerning is how many use that type of language I just talked about and how many people in mainline denominations, and they've never even walked in the power of God. I mean, they've never even cast out demons in Jesus' name. They've never even flowed in the gifts of the Spirit and prophesied. And uh, I think that's concerning as well. And so it's not an either or. It should be a both and. It should be that the call of the gospel is that all people everywhere repent and then place sincere faith in Jesus. So what's sincere faith? Well, that's where Scripture says it's not just those who say, Lord, Lord. It's those who call on the Lord out of a sincere heart. That's what Paul taught. And then also when he wrote in his letter to Timothy, he explains it more. Uh, he gives this beautiful picture of true repentance and the necessity of true repentance. This is why so many are being deceived in our churches today because they think they can stay in their uh, sexual immorality or their willful sin or, uh, you know, and, and claim Christ and claim that they're a child of God. Not, not without repentance, from sin and faith toward God. We must be born again. So Paul, here in uh, 2 Timothy 2, he says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. So there's a foundation that has God's seal of approval. Well, this is a picture, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, there's no other foundation which someone can lay, to, which is Christ. And the seal was, of course, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, and then he was vindicated through the resurrection from the dead. So the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In the Greek, that depart is a one-time departure. It's someone that has the light of the gospel and God's holiness shine in on their life, and they realize that the entire life they lived is filled with complete, gross sin and wickedness. And they see that their life is as filthy rags. And they never saw that before. They were blind. But the light of the gospel has opened their eyes. Then they see the wrath of God is upon their entire house, in a sense, their life that they've lived in. And so they repent. They change the preference of this will, their will. They no longer want to stay in that place of sin and wickedness in a house that the wrath of God is coming upon. And they want to exit. Well, they can't exit on their own. But the good news is, is their, a door's been provided. Jesus Christ and what God did through his finished work. So they put sincere faith that Jesus is the door. And then they call on him out of true believing, repentance and faith. And of course, he then saves. So that's what calling on the name uh, of the Lord is with a sincere heart. It's one who has departed from iniquity, a life of iniquity, a life of lawlessness, and gets transferred out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light? Great question.